Okay, well, hello everyone. I'm Kayla McEwen, Collections Curator at the South Dakota Art Museum. Welcome to the third and final virtual <coughs> artist chat featuring artists from the GIFT exhibition, curated by Dr. Craig Howe of the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies in Martin, South Dakota. We're so happy you're joining us tonight. Uh, this virtual artist chat is made possible through the generous support of donors like you because the South Dakota Art Museum receives operational funding from South Dakota State University and the South Dakota Arts Council. Your donations, memberships, and gifts fund fantastic exhibitions and programs like this, so thank you. Shortly, we'll hear from three artists featured in the gift whose work is on display at the South Dakota Art Museum in Brookings through July 31st. The exhibition is based on the traditional Lakotan narrative of the white buffalo woman and includes artwork, poems, and music by 39 Lakotan creatives. Joining us tonight are visual artists Athena Latoka, Iris Sully, and Alfreda Bertrack Aljo. Each artist will share about themselves and their work, followed by a brief Q&A. Please save questions for the end of the program or feel free to input them in the chat throughout. Abigail Ramsbottom, Curator of Education, will introduce each artist and she and I will moderate the Q&A at the end of the program. Abby, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Um, and like Taylor said, we're gonna get started tonight with Athena Latoka, who's currently living in New York. And I believe Carolyn has her slides. We want to go ahead and move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, and what um, coming coming to everything as uh, as a painter, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the artists that I continually go back to in terms of grounding is uh, the painter Philip Gustin. And this is a particularly important quote that uh, continually grounds me in like where I am, who I am, and how I'm how I'm dealing with or finding or contending with uh, everything around me. So here he's he's placing with him with himself within this environment, this this total situation. Um, so it, it goes beyond just what we see. Um, and it pulls into that, I think, um, other elements, uh, you know, th that we perceive around us. So Basically, it's like looking at different modes of perception, right? Not just visual perception. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and then also uh, looking at Philip Gust or um, Robert Smithson, who who's talking about you know the the larger world outside of us, outside of the galleries, um, looking into uh, the natural environments, um, and looking at at nature and uh, the the process of nature as it evolves. Right. So it's this this continual growth, this evolution, the fact that um, there's you know this this process uh, that uh, is too can, should be considered or that can be considered in the process of, it, of making one's work. So these are different contexts um, that I look at the work through. Um, so uh, just the environment and the fact that things are never finished. So it's constantly questioning, uh, questioning the studio practice. Um, we can go to the next slide. So in terms of situating oneself, um, I can't help but look at my own work from the perspective of where I come from. So being born in Alaska, uh, growing up in Alaska, and having the wilderness literally right out the back door growing up, that incredibly influenced um, how I understand my own self, my own world, and how I relate to it. So this is an image of uh, uh, from Alaska. This is Denali National Park. Um, and in, in here you see, you know, nature carving the world. You know, you see the rivers that are carving the land and you see glaciers that have carved the land. And later this became incredibly influential for me in terms of as an as an artist how we make things 
how we shape things, how we give form to things. And the fact that things are made, you know, and, and shaped not just by humans, but also the natural world and the various influences um, that all of that has on, you know, anything, any material thing, right? So if we go to the next slide, you know, here's an image of, of a glacier, right? And showing the scale of uh, humans next to these large masses, these forms in, that we find outside. We can go to the next slide. It's just another detail showing the various textures. We're talking about, you know, years and years of, of, of mass that have been building up. And the fact that even though it, the, this glacier, this is Exit Glacier, in the Kenai Peninsula and of Alaska. And uh, this, this glacier, you know, is, is something that's uh, like everything. It's, it's alive, it's moving, it's, um, it's, it's growing, expanding, contracting. Um, and one of the things that I quite often do is uh, I try to situate myself there by spending time with it, listening to it, feeling it, um, trying to get, you know, an understanding of the presence of something. So uh, this is just a massive glacier. And for me, I enjoy the elements of movement and how you can see the striations, you can see the, the, the way that the earth is compressed and moving along the surface of it as a, a as the glacier itself moves through the various seasons and through the years. We can move to the next slide. It's just another detail showing the, um, the dirt, the debris that's settling on the surface of the glacier and how that's, um, how you get those indications of the glacial movement through how that sediment or that material, um, the, the basically like the, the trail that it makes um, as the glacier is moving. We can move to the next slide. It's just a detail, the various colors and the movements. Mm -hmm. And let's go to the next slide. So th that has a lot to do, I was just talking briefly about, you know, movement, um, the material. Um, the next couple slides I want to show you are uh, addressing the tool use. Um, what we're looking at here, some folks might recognize this. I don't know if anybody you know, might recognize these. Um, these are referred to as bone brushes. They're Lakota bone brushes, and these fit very comfortably, easily in the palm of your hand. But, um, you know, and it's peculiar that you know, we classify these things as bone brushes, you know, you know, why, you know, and, but for me, I'm constantly looking at um, how we interact with the various materials, you know, as an artist, you know, we're trained to uh, apply paint um, pigments um, with, with brushes, palette knives, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm very interested in looking at how other people, other peoples, you know, through history around the world, um, use tools and instruments to, um, to apply and to work with the material, to work with the surface, to um, work with the support, and how, you, how you introduce different elements or chemicals, agents, materials, you know, to the support upon which you're working. So these are uh, Lakota uh, bone brushes. We can move to the next slide. Um, this is a palette from a, uh, a Zuni, uh, Zuni woman down in, um, she was actually on the rim of, uh, uh, of the Grand Canyon, uh, demonstrating, uh, painting techniques on ceramic vessels. So this is a, a palette that her family had used, had passed down from generation to generation. I don't know if this is her great grandmother or great, great grandmother's palette. Um, and in the upper right corner, you see two blades of grass that she's using to, uh, to paint with. So again, this is just, um, you know, and I apologize for not um, bringing up her name. I lost it through my research, uh, through my notes, but, you know, and I apologize for that. Um, it's important to remember names, right? <laughs> um, 
so, but anyway, it's, it's, it's looking at just other tools, other materials used to, to um, apply the material with. And you can see per um, the little stone in the center at the top that's uses to grind the pigments down into the, me into the various mediums. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, looking at other ways to apply and work with the material has uh, led me to uh, find my own way into the, in my studio practice to work with materials uh, to, uh, to introduce the pigments. Um, so I started collecting tire shred off the sides of highways. And it has become over the past 10 years, one of the primary tools, one of the primary instruments that I've used to work with, not just in uh, painting, but also in ink wash painting, ink wash drawing. Um, and um, the, the tire tread, you know, it has steel radial in it. And so I use the, that to actually um, drag the, ink wash or paint or to scrape it up, to move it around, to manipulate it, to um, um, introduce mark making techniques, uh, not just through the steel radial, but through the tire tread marks itself as well. So we can move to the next slide. And the next slide, sorry. So, um, yep. And let's move to the next slide. This is um, down in the down in Louisiana. I was an artist in residence down and spent three months down in New Orleans. And um, again, a lot of what I do has to do is has very much to do with it's place based, place inspired, place influenced. So, um, uh, so being down in New Orleans, I had never been in that type of environment before. So it was important for me to go out as soon as I got there, um, go out to the swamp um, to start grounding myself in, in this, this unique place, this fragile ecosystem, you know, what is it um, to, be, to be there? So I ended up collecting some Spanish moss, bringing that into the studio. So we were looking here at an image of the Spanish moss outdoors. We can go to the next, slide and looking at flora fauna right so watching the alligators move watching them swim watching them hunt spending time with um other life other beings in these places we can move to the next slide looking at the cultural history so this is a um, they refer to it as a tenant's house Right, but it's um, these were actually places where um, enslaved uh, folks had lived and worked in the plantations. So understanding cultural history is also important to me and influences me in the studio. This is you know all of this is information, material, perceptual you know um, information that comes back with me to the studio to help inform, develop, and there's particular emotions. Um, that come into play uh, as, as I'm developing the work. Um, so it's important, important for me to get like a broad spectrum and scope of the land. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, sugar industry, sugar mill, next slide. Sugar cane burning, next slide. And industry, you know, the impact of industry. Um, on the people in the land down the area. We can move to the next slide and the next slide. Um, and this is the work that was created uh, while I was um, down in New Orleans. So um, again, most of the work that I wanted to do was pretty much based, I thought I was gonna build, build work, develop work based on the industry, um, looking at disaster, natural disasters, human made disasters, looking at the swamp, looking at big, big industry that is um, polluting the Mississippi River there. Um, and what I found myself doing toward the end in the development of the work, it, 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 it ended up moving in this direction. And what, I, what came out were these images of being in the swamp, being immersed in this, this environment. Um, so 
and that was not expected. It was, um, I was really thinking it was gonna go more towards some sort of human made industrial park type situation. We can move to the next line. Installation shot of that. Details. Next slide. Mississippi River mud embedded into the work itself. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, this is uh, this is New York City. Uh, this is a demolition site. We can move to the next slide. And this is an uh, image of the studio with at the beginning of a work in. Um, in play. Next slide. Um, this work here, I wanted to look at the, uh, the glacial striations that have uh, glacial movements that have shaped Manhattan, the, uh, be the bedrock of Manhattan upon which a large, um, the larger uh, um, skyscrapers are built. Right, because the bedrock is able to support these massive buildings. Um, let's move to the next slide. This is one of the pieces that was created as a result of spending time um, exploring the New York City environment, looking at the history, looking at geopolitical, social, political, psychological histories that are overlapped here, not just with the, um, the history of the Lenape, but looking at um, the col colonization by the Dutch, the history of colonization by the, also the British, um, those various histories. Um, and also overlaying that with the glacial striations that took place on, um, you know, on Manhattan dating back 10 to 14,000 years ago. Let's move to the next slide. And the next slide. Just some details of that, that's um, detritus, demolition sediment built into the surfaces. Next slide, let's keep going. Okay, all right, and let's move. Hmm, I think we missed some slides. Let's, can you flip through these quickly? Go forward, now forward. <laughs> yeah, let's, and let's, let's keep going more and more and more. Okay, this is the work that is um, in the, uh, the gift exhibition. Um, so for this, uh, the particular passage that I was working with was the, um, the presentation of, of the pipe and talking about how, um, you know, looking at uh, the sorrow and grief, uh, looking at, um, you know, the, You know, but when the when the when the pipe was presented, you know, it was a you know a, a gift, right? And it, and it was the particular phrase was talking about how um, that there there's so much sorrow to be born, um, and that you know how do you find a way through your sorrow and through the grief? And thinking about um, thinking about that, and thinking about the the deceased and when they're gone, and you know, I kept thinking about prayers and thinking about um, you know, smudging and burning and offering uh, offering these these thoughts, these prayers toward uh, you know, for for folks that have passed. And in the process of doing that, you know, I, I kept returning to, um, you know, burning, you know, cedar and sweetgrass. And um, so I was, I had these, the, the piles of ash um, as a result of that. So what I had started doing is um, quite often in my work, I start from nothing. So we had the parameters of the scale, you know, to within which to work. So this piece is 44 by 44 inches. And what I had started doing was um, putting all those thoughts and thinking about, um, you know, passage of time and uh, the fact that our, our, our time here is so limited and thinking about ancestors in place and trying to ground myself within, you know, that, that, that continuum. Um, thinking about that eternal present, um, the eternal now, and 
so I started laying down ink wash, trying to figure out where to go with this, thinking about, um, you know, the young, the generations, the elders. And what happened was I started depositing all of that ash into the work and moving that around. And I, I there was no, I, I couldn't develop an image. So what happened was there was a layering of material that happened. So it was throwing ink down and then obfuscating that with ash and trying to, and, and rubbing it in. So really building up the surfaces of it and then flooding it with water. And in the process of doing so and just super saturating the work, um, the, the layers of the paper um, and the resin coating on the paper, everything started delaminating. So I just kept pushing it and pushing it and, and then it started peeling back. So I just let it happen. Um, so what you see here is, is a breaking down of the, um, of, the, of the paper, breaking down of the surface and um, in a way, it, it really led me to think about how, um, you know, in time and the material and working of the surfaces, how in the process of breaking down and destroying something that, you know, there, there's a transformation that takes place. So, so for me, this, this is about that kind of transformation. Um, and if we move to the next slide, um, this is the, the other piece that was made. Oh, it disappeared. Did it disappear? It's Sorry. still showing for me, yes, Athena. There, okay, yes, it is. Um, this is another piece that was made for, um, for the, uh, uh, the Inipi ceremony for, for, as an auxiliary piece. And these piece, this piece here was made, I work on the floor. So the ink pools on the floor. And what I was doing, I, I was thinking about the grandfathers. So I was um, heating up stones in the studio. I mean, here in New York City, it's not like you can just you know, go out and have a sweat lodge. Um, and being away from a lot of these, these, um, these uh, opportunities um, and th these places um, of prayer and offering, um, you kind of have to, you know, I don't know what, but um, so I found myself um, heating up these large stones in the studio and um, heating them up so that they're glowing and uh, with propane torches and um, introducing those to pools of ink on the paper. So this is actually an imprint of a, um, of a burnt uh, a, a heated rock that was put into the pool of ink and then let to reconfigure it and, and make itself during um, the process of the hot, red hot rock being placed on a wet pool of black ink. And what happened as a result of that was this incredible, you know, just this vestige of this, this stone imprint. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, what's next? Um, these are some pieces that I developed that just are on view here in New York, in upstate New York, based on the local environment there. Um, so this is, um, this is what that is. They're 44 by 48, um, 60, 120 inches. And that's it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Athena. So for those of you that have questions, you can put them in the chat, but we're going to hold off on a Q&A until all the artists have presented. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I really love the photographic elements you shared. So with that, we'll have um, Iris Sully continue the conversation. So Iris is an artist living in Custer, South Dakota. And I'll let you take it away. <laughs> okay, I am Suchangu Lakota from the Rosebud Reservation, and 
uh, have been honored to do the last five um, exhibits with Dr. Howe and Cairns. And so hopefully <laughs> we will get this. Um, this was uh, the first one that I did. And my work is normally uh, carved. All of this is one piece of wood, it's carved. And then I do the dressing separately. This, I'm sorry, we'll go back. This was the first one, this was the emergence. The very first um, exhibit that we did with Karen's. And then this was with a Dockway exhibit and it was about the ghost dance in front of the Badlands. Again, it's a one piece of wood. So when, and this was the 1868 treaty. Uh, but this is, more of how I started. I started with dancers and uh, hand drummers, different things, smaller, much smaller dolls. And so when I got involved with these exhibits, it really stretched everything that I was doing. <laughs> I was like, because the very first one, Craig gave me an assignment. I'm like, okay. <laughs> And so I had to really think about it and try new, um, new ways of carving, new ways of dressing, trying to make it look older. And, and then it kind of evolved into this piece for the gift. And initially, I thought, I'm never gonna pull this off. I had broken my arm and, and so I did it left-handed and I couldn't carve obviously without two hands. But um, my part of the story was about keeping the spirit. And I think that so many times I've been back home to funerals and different things where we, they set out spirit plates. And I was very, very familiar with that part of it. But portraying that was really, really difficult for me, especially in a medium that I wasn't normally used to doing. So, um, I put this on trade cloth, I built a frame. I had a friend help me build a frame <laughs> and uh, put it on trade cloth. And I put the 12 moons to represent the years passing, the, the one year passing. And of course the seven stars to represent our seven bands. The, the people in the foreground are beaded. It's really hard to tell on the on the picture, but they're all beaded onto the trade cloth. And I left the open space for the spirit to pass pass through into the Milky Way. And I get kind of emotional still thinking about this piece. It was um uh pretty profound for me to do it and kind of sent me in a new direction as an artist to really open up different ideas and try new things. And, and then <laughs> I took it, uh, sent it to Karen and, and he said, uh, you didn't read the part where it has to be 16 by 16. And I said, no, because I was carving at the time. I was going by the carving dimensions. So I had to adapt it a little bit. And that's when I added the edges with the cowrie shells, which I thought were significant, and the cones. And I just turned out, it just, um, 
help me see a different way of looking at things. So all of Craig's exhibits, excuse me, Dr. Howe's exhibits, <laughs> um, have brought me a little bit further, I think, as an artist to try different things, to add, um, no matter what happens, you can usually come up with something if um, you put yourself in the right mindset. And at the time I was in Arizona and then of course COVID happened the same day I broke my arm. They shut down everything the same day I broke my arm. Like, it's a sign. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, uh, the story to me in and of itself. And when I visited with Dr. Howe in the beginning, he said, present it as a gift. And I do believe that it is a gift to us to hold their spirit for a year and, and to keep, to take care of them. And then once we release it, they're always with us. And to me, that is the, um, the, the true gift part of what the Buffalo Calf Woman brought to us. And I know we all see it differently. We've all heard different stories, but um, that is what resonates to me for this piece. Um, somebody asked me about the people in the, in the foreground. How, they asked me why nine. I said, because I didn't want 10 little Indians. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but they, um, but it's kind of true too. I wanted to be completely, uh, I thought about uh, my cousin who had sisters and how many people went out and took care of their offerings and kept the spirit plate going. And I just, find that a really um, remarkable thing to do when, you know, if you think about anything in our lives these days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this plan, I'm gonna exercise. But this was such a commitment for people to get these, keep the spirit plate going and, and to do it for an entire year uh, in honor of the person that had passed and it's just this is one of the I learned a lot from the other pieces that Craig um, <laughs> uh, challenged me with but this one just kind of fell together and and felt like it was really part of my experience from home. I had not long after I started this had attended a wiping of the tears ceremony. And so it, this piece meant a lot to me personally. Um, at any rate, we'll go back so I don't get too emotional on y'all. <laughs> this is, these are kind of how I started. And like I said, all of my pieces are, I initially started with uh, dancers. And this was a fancy dancer that I did. This was before Craig's show, of course, but, and horse dancer. And I had so many wonderful experiences along the way, visiting with elders, visiting with, uh, other artists, I can never thank Richard Redell enough for all of his input. From the very first show I went to, he helped me with my lighting because I am not a trained artist. I started uh, beating when I was very young. I taught myself how to carve. And I've always liked making something out of very little. And 
my very first doll, I literally pulled a piece of wood off the log, off the firewood pile and started carving. And I told my mom, I said, I think we had looked at some things in a tourist trap. I can do better than that. <laughs> and I just started playing with it. And that was about uh, 20 years ago. Unfortunately, I hadn't been able to do it steady the entire time just because I was raising three energetic boys who found a way of getting into mischief and whatnot. But so sometimes I had to take a step back. And that was okay for me too, because that also contributed to um, learning more about life and how to raise boys and how to help them to be good men. So my artwork really contributed, I think, that way too. Um, I just kind of flip back through these so you can see them, but, and I know that my presentation is fairly short, but it's um, truly from the heart. Thank you so much, Iris. Is that mm. like the end? Yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. And um, yes, that was a little emotional. I, I appreciate you sharing. Um, so we will finish this evening with our third and final artist for our artist chat series. And I would like to welcome Alfreda Bertrack Aljo, who is coming to us from Palisade, Colorado. Hi, everyone. Now, this is the um, first piece that I did for the gift. And um, I want to introduce myself first. Um, I am Alfreda Beartrack Aljo. Um, I am from Lower Brule, South Dakota. And I currently live in Palisade, Colorado. And where I, I'm busy managing my online gallery or on-site gallery and working in my studio and growing lavender. And um, I, I'm an artist and an author and a storyteller. And everything, every work that I do, I try to tell a story, uh, make it meaningful to me and the viewer. And when Dr. Um, Powell invited me to be part of the gift exhibit, I was really excited. I said, yeah, um, I, I want to do this. And so um, let's go back, Caroline, to the other one. So this piece that I did, the first piece, was uh, um, digital. And the reason I chose a digital format was the seven sacred rites are the gift is very meaningful to me. I participated in every single one of them. And I see it as a blueprint for not only individually for our people, but collectively as a tribe. And so I thought to myself, everything that white buffalo cow brought to us is just as relevant today as it was back then. So I painted on uh, different mediums on paper and I scanned it into a graphic program, different layers, merged the layers and uh, burned the image on, onto glass. So it had the appearance of stained glass, but very opaque. And, and I wanted it modern. And then let's go to the next piece. And I, 
<laughs> the, the piece that was hanging in, at the Octa Lakota Museum when uh, um, Dixie called me, uh, curator there, and she said that they were taking the piece down, the digital art piece, and that it didn't quite fit into the show because it wasn't quite organic uh, enough or it didn't fit in. And she wanted to know if I would do another piece. Um, and so I doc talked to Dr. Howell and I decided to do another piece. And I did this in one day. It's acrylic on canvas. It's 16 by 16 actually. Um, and so is the other piece. And, um, and I did it one day. I let it dry for three days. I mailed it out on the fourth day. And I believe it was hanging back and up in the exhibit the next week. So it was as an artist, you always have to be on your toes. You never, never take things for granted. And so I, um, in this piece here, I envision, like I said, I tell stories with, with everything I do. I envision this, this young lady and um, chosen for her purity tossing the buffalo hair ball out to the four directions and above and creating um, relationships. And again, back to the seven sacred rites or the gift as I know them, they're all enmeshed in one another. And in throwing that ball out, she's creating hookah relatives and a relationship with those individuals that will catch it. And bring it back in and um, they, they bring back again a responsibility to her and the tribe. And so I was telling the story as I was painting of what I remember. And there's the four directions um, set up, the red for the north, the yellow, the east, the white to the south and the black to the west and the circle, the altar and she's in the center of life. And, uh, and I thought also about, I want, you know, I, this was meaningful to me because throwing the ball keeps us looking up at Wankan Tonka, Tungashila, keeps our eyes up. And it um, keeps us hopeful. And this was the last right gift that came and I believe it came at a time that was when the people needed it most to look up and have hope. So I, I enjoyed doing this piece and um, I, I'm glad to be part of the gift exhibit. So on to the next slide. This is a um, view of the tribal chambers um, complex at Lower Brule. And back in 2001, I was commissioned to do a mural inside this teepee here. I'm gonna circle it. You can see the size of it. Um, so you can imagine what inside is. And um, when they approached me, my tribe approached me, it was in the dead of winter and they wanted done, it done and ready by May. They were going to have a grand opening. And so could you go back, Carolyn? And so um, I, I painted uh, two things. There was no heat in the building. It was still under construction and I was scared of heights. And uh, so uh, the construction crew put a scaffold up and I put a snowsuit on and thick gloves and laid on my back most of the time. And I painted in, up under murals. And there's, oh gosh, I would say um, um, the seven, eight, and, and they're about 10 by 12 foot in, in size. So that was a challenge. So I thought about that when I did this 16 by 16 gift painting, I thought, oh, this is a piece of cake. I can do this. <laughs> so next slide. And I always look at inspiration. Um, I was inspired by a fresco master artist, Federico Vigil. And um, 
I was doing a dance performance and he uh, was commissioned to do a, a huge fresco. And I think what inspired me is that I knew he was also scared of heights, but he worked from the heights, you know, height that, that uh, and, and did wonderful paintings. So he was an inspiration. Next slide. And these are, um, oh, visuals of the gift that I did in the tribal complex. So the middle one is white buffalo cow woman bringing the chinupa to our people. And around her are the various um, rites or gifts that came to us from Wakam Tonka through her. And so um, that again is, you know, one project I did. Next slide. And this one is looking out over the river and you can see part of the murals up there. And this is what the tribal council sees when they're making decisions for our tribe. And down below here is a herd of buffaloes. So it's a nice view. Next slide. And this was, uh, these next slides will just give you a, an idea of uh, the types of medium that I work in, the various types of art. And this is done, this is watercolor on paper, rag paper. And it's called Calling in the Buffalo. And again, a story. I envisioned the story of a man here. Um, he painted the shirt with specific symbols and he danced to bring the buffalo back. He went to a place beyond this world and a place where our relatives were happy and the buffalo were plentiful. And so in his faith, he put the shirt on and he danced to bring them back to call them home. And this particular art piece won second place in division two at the Northern Plains Art Market in 2017. Okay, next slide. And this one is oil on canvas and it's he, he who faces the storm. And this is a story of a buffalo. And in his mind, he's thinking, if I run from the storm, it will overtake me and the storm will last longer. But if I walk through it, I will get through it sooner and the skies are clear on the other side. So I did this piece um, with the idea that in life, storms will come, but the sooner we face them and get through them, things get better. And this next piece is, okay, <laughs> protectors. And this is a uh, canvas around pounded nickel. And uh, it's acrylic. And it um, speaks about many Richoni or sacred water and the protectors that um, the leaders in our tribe that protect us. And so that piece was very, um, very special. And all of these are in private collections. And the next piece, this is currently at the uh, Contemporary Art Show in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. I am because we are. And it's painted on a high drum. Um, the drum is about four inches thick. And this shows us as human beings in the matrix of life and how everything is interconnected. And um, next slide. And this is a fun piece. This is called um, Earth My Mother. And this is basically a style that I use in my illustrations and my books, my children's books. And it's about nurturing. Our mother is nurturing us, our mother earth. And we are the baby. <laughs> Next slide. And this is my first book, children's book. It's called The Day the Earth Rose Up. I illustrated this and wrote the story. And it was really a, a, a fun story for me to write. Um, I, through the years, I've heard many stories about Pleiades um, in my travels to different countries and um, various tribes and cultures. 
it was something that always fascinated me in my own Lakota story with it, the seven sisters. And so I took everything together and made it meaningful to me. And I wrote this story and I, I, as I was writing it, it was in the middle of winter story time, you know, for us Lakota people. And I would go outside and look up at the stars and I would say, oh, this is, it, it's, it's so wonderful to have sacred above, sacred below. And um, so it, it was a good book. I, I, it's out now currently available. Um, and the next book is um, historical fiction. It's a teen novel. There's three books. This is the first book. It's fun. It's, it's exciting. There's a lot of adventure. And it actually tells uh, a story about the resilience of a young man, uh, kind of like a coming of age, in 1929. And um, when we face some of the dark times in our history of uh, being forced into boarding schools and forced into a different kind of culture. So I took stories from my uncles, my dad, my father, my grandfather, and I combined everything together um, about um, what it was like for young people in 1929 on a reservation in South Dakota. So that book is also out. This book will be out in a few weeks. I illustrated this one, How the Oceans Came to Be, and with a colleague of mine, an, an author, Arvis Bogman. And it is a really fun Lumbee story. And again, that will be out in a few weeks. Next slide. And here are some of the books that are coming out that I illustrated. And this book here is very special. Um, a, call, a, fellow, okay, the, a fellow author, Jesse Hummingbird, started this and um, he didn't make it. He passed away before he could finish this book. And his widow contacted me and asked me to, if I would be interested in finishing this book for him, illustrating it. And I did, and it was very emotional for me um, to use his paints and hold his brushes. So it, it was so honorable for me to be able to honor him. And I was thankful for that. And this one, again, I are all out. There's the dates on them. Legends of Big Heart, Roan Stallion will be out February 2023rd. And so all of these books, again, show my art, show and my stories. And uh, next slide. And so this is me. This is my contact information. And I want to say Wopi Tonka to all of you. And I want to give a big uh, thank you to, um, again, Dr. Greg Howell and um, South Dakota Arts Council Museum and to all the other artists. I'm very impressed with all of your work. I'm, I'm impressed to be part of this gift exhibit. And I I'm, I'm just want to say, keep up the good work. Um, there's not very many Native artists in the world, Native American artists. So it's wonderful to see these events like this and see so many artists together. And with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it back over to Caroline and thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I understand that it is 6.30, so it is about the time that we finish up, but for those of you who want to stay, we have about 15 minutes for a Q and A. So um, please feel free to put some questions in the chat. And I don't know, Taylor, if you wanted to share some of the comments that have been um, brought up during the talk, that'd be great. Uh, just lots of nice comments about your work and the exhibit. Diane Moore said that she visited this week and the show was so enjoyable. Um, let's see here, I'm scrolling through. 
And I do think there was a question about um, the materials you use, uh, Athena, whether they're on canvas or paper. And I do think we maybe answered that, that they're, you work largely on paper, correct? Correct, mostly it's paper and there's lead elements and there's natural materials that are incorporated into it from the environment. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Donna Merck asks, uh, what kind of paper? How do the natural materials adhere? <laughs> I'm super the, fascinated about your process, Athena. Yeah, well, me too. Because uh, <laughs> uh, it's always about learning, right? And I always like getting in there, kind of mixing it up and um, challenging what the expectations that we all have. So it's a resin coated paper. Um, and the materials are adhered through the, uh, the mediums themselves. So I'm using a, a shellac-based ink. So the shellac is a nice binder. Um, and it's just, it's, it's basically just, you know, different levels of concentration. Um, so, you know, you find ways to make it attach. You know? <laughs> And what kind of materials? Um, it's all locally sourced wherever I'm working. Um, like down in Louisiana, it was working with uh, the Mississippi mud, bringing that into the studio with the, um, the Spanish moss, bringing that in. And it was, they're never brought in to, with the assumption that it was going to become integrated. It was, it's all brought in to gain familiarity. Like you know, for the gift, for example, um, it just so, you know, burning the medicines, you know, it was a center, a way of centering and grounding myself, trying to figure out what am I doing? What am I doing? And in, in the process of doing it, it all goes into the work and it, it ended up being there. Um, but again, not, not going in with that intent. Lynette asks for Iris. I'm curious about the painting behind you on the screen. She asks, is it an Oscar Howe? Huh. Uh, actually, it is a Richard Redall. Uh, I'll show you the whole piece, uh, maybe. <laughs> See if I can get up here. And, and um, it is the four traditional colors, traditional dancers dancing toward the Black Hills. And Richard and I were talking um, one day and I told him about the piece that I wanted to do with the four traditional dolls on it. So it has a pretty special meaning because he painted it for me. He painted an, a couple of other ones very similar. But he, yeah, it's, and I know Richard took a lot of um, inspiration from Oscar Howe. But yeah. so it kind of has that feeling about it. But yeah, it's a Richard Redall. Thank you for asking. Yeah, and, and Lynette, um, Richard does have a piece in the gift as well, which I'll drop a link right here to his piece on the website. So you can check that up as well. Um, I missed a question. Donna asks, Iris, since you've tried this new method of creating, do you plan to try more 2D compositions in the future? I have been, I've, I've started kind of small, trying some fun things. And especially, uh, I try very hard to not do it for the economy, but we all need our bread and butter pieces. And so I am doing some fun things on um, smaller trade cloth pieces. We'll see where that goes. <laughs> see where it takes me to. Yeah, she says, nice, we look forward to seeing them. Thank you. I have a question for Alfreda. Um, so you you spoke about your practice with storytelling and your illustration, and I found that really fascinating um, and its connection to your work as a visual artist. Um, 
but do you want to speak a little bit more or do you feel like there is a relationship between your work as a lavender farmer and your art um, and yeah, kind of well, like if those have an interplay? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm always um, attracted to earth healing plants. It grounds me and um, and with the lavender, it, it really does help me focus. <laughs> so in growing it, it um, I incorporate it into my ceramics and pottery. Um, some of my paintings are just um, whitewashed with a lavender around it, which is, is really um, stunning and simple, very simple. And so I, it's just a, a thing, a medium I've been called to do um, right now. And it, it, planting and working with earth healing plants, if it be harvesting sage and cedar and sweet grass or growing lavender, to me is uh, a very um, sacred process like creating a piece of work. You put your soul into it, and it's it's, and I, I find that um, that's the the easy part for me is I getting ideas. I get ideas all the time, but the hard part is taking that idea and turning it into something, making it work. And 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 what's really interesting for me is how do you get from A to D? You know, what is the process in between? And every one of these artists has a story of that we don't know about that how they got to that in peace and to me it's, it's like you know doing growing lavender there's a story in between the process of how we started here to here because we distill essential oils so that's a lot of product packed down into a steam distiller to get a little bottle of lavender that is so pure the essence of it is just so special and so I just, you know, I'm just thrilled again to be able to do this at my age. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the chat? Well, or anything else that artists want to share before we wrap up? That's the end of questions. Um, I wouldn't mind saying that part of what attracted me to the Karen's exhibits is that they were so much about education. And um, as, certainly the first one, I was involved at the Britain Museum in Bighorn, Wyoming and bringing busloads of school children in, just teaching a new generation about our old stories and our ways and how they um, made a difference to us, even for those of us that didn't live on the reservation, even for those of us that go back for family, or that, but I really appreciate that about these exhibits because I think they've shown a lot of young people um, a different mindset about our culture. I'd like to add to that. Um, as a lot of the artists in this exhibit and what I'm hearing, uh, a lot of the artists live away from the reservation but we still connect to our homeland. So in a lot of, you know, Dr. Hall's exhibits is the dual citizenship of being a citizen in our nation and a citizen in the United States. And a lot of us as artists, we, we talk about going home, you know, to the reservation or to where we're from, but yet we reside in a different place. And it's almost like having two homes. And I find that very interesting um, in a lot of these shows when um, various artists are presenting their work. There's always that element of that base, home base there that is the culture and the tribe. 
So I just want to mention that as well. Thank you. Well, I think if, uh, if there aren't any further questions before we wrap up, I do want to thank you, Athena, Iris, and Alfreda, uh, for sharing your time and talent with us tonight, and to all of you uh, for joining us from near and far. We also want to give a big thank you to Dr. Craig Howe of Cairns for curating this wonderful exhibition for his ongoing partnership with us at the museum. Um, as I said earlier, the, the exhibition is up through July 31st, so please come out and visit us. And thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Tonight. Thank you. Hope to hear from you. Everyone. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.